Good afternoon, everyone. We're just going to give people a moment to connect before we officially kick things off. All right. Thank you for joining HHS's briefing on MPOX for providers who care for pediatric populations. My name is Betsy Weand, and I'm the Public Health Policy Advisor in the Office of Intergovernmental and External Affairs here at the Department of Health and Human Services. This briefing is open to the public. However, the conversation should be considered off the record, and any press inquiries for HHS should be directed to the press office at media at hhs.gov. There will be time at the end for Q&A, so we encourage you to submit your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any time during the briefing. Thanks to all of our speakers who will, you'll be hearing from today. During today's call, you'll hear from leaders at the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about where things stand on MPOX CLAID-1 abroad and learn about the epidemiology of MPOX among pediatric populations. We're also joined by staff from the FDA's Office of Vaccines Research and Review. First, I'd like to introduce someone who has been working diligently with her team on the domestic MPOX response through the Summers of Pride syndemic response and is a trained pediatrician, Assistant Secretary for Health, Admiral Rachel Levine. Dr. Levine, over to you. Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here. And as, as she mentioned, as a pediatrician myself, I am so pleased to join such a dedicated group of healthcare providers and support everyone striving to provide high quality care across our nation. So thank you for joining us today to discuss the current state of MPOX in the United States, including a situational update on clade one MPOX virus and the United States preparedness and response. The Biden-Harris administration has been working closely to monitor the spread of MPOX, specifically clade one MPOX overseas, and has been working since December 2023 to prepare domestically. Now, it's importantly, there are no known cases of clade one MPOX in the United States at this time. However, HHS continues to monitor this every day, and the United States is well prepared to rapidly detect, contain, and manage clade one cases should they occur domestically. The United States continues to increase our capacity to detect cases of clade one and clade two B MPOX through existing surveillance systems, including wastewater testing, and through expanding the robust diagnostic testing capacity built during the ongoing clade 2B outbreak to ensure coverage for clade 1 should it occur domestically. Children and adolescents can become infected with MPOX through contact with people or animals and with contaminated materials. This includes close skin-to-skin -skin, skin -skin contact, such as might occur during cuddling, caregiving, or bed sharing, transmission across the placenta in utero, or contact during the birthing process, contact with body fluids and respiratory secretions of patients with MPOX, or with contaminated fomites and sexual contact. I want to especially ask organizations serving pediatric and adolescent populations to help share the CDC information on MPOX. Now, here are some important points for you to consider. MPOX should be considered when children or adolescents present with a rash that is consistent with the disease, especially if epidemiologic criteria are present. Infants, children with eczema or other skin conditions, and children with in, immunocompromising conditions may be at increased risk of severe disease. Treatment should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis for children and adolescents with suspected, probable, or confirmed MPOX who are at risk of severe disease or who develop complications of MPOX. Ticoviramat is the first-line medication to treat MPOX, including in children and adolescents. 
Children and adolescents with close contact to people with suspected, probable, or confirmed MPOX may be eligible for post-exposure prophylaxis, or PEP, with vaccination, immune globulin, or antiviral medication. Adolescents at risk for MPOX may receive the Gineos vaccination before an exposure. To protect public health, we recommend including MPOX vaccination as part of a package of sexual health services that includes HIV and STI, testing, treatment, and prevention. And I want to encourage you to promote the importance of getting tested for MPOX and to get your MPOX vaccination for those who have not already done so. The vaccine is now widely available through health providers, clinics, and in other locations, such as at community events. Um, HSSIEA mentioned our Summer of Pride event for the LGBTQI plus community, where we, uh, which continues beyond June. And we are st uh, strongly uh, recommending and even working with local providers to provide vaccination at these community events. Now, the challenges of the past two year, few years from the acute phase of the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond have reminded us of a fundamental truth that we truly need each other. Our happiness and our survival depend upon our connections to one another and to our community. And so now is an important time to remember that and always that we are stronger together. So now I'm very pleased to turn things over to my colleagues at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral Levine. Uh, my name is Alga Morrell, and I'm the, um, the Chief Medical Officer in CDC's Pox Virus and Rabies Branch, and I'll be providing an update um, about the Clade 1 response. There we go. Okay. All right. So um, you all know that uh, MPOX is caused by a virus, which is called monkeypox virus. So that virus name has not changed. It's still monkeypox virus, which for short is MPXV. Uh, MPXV spreads primarily via close skin-to-skin -skin contact with infected lesions, as Admiral Levine has already explained. This includes during sex. It can also spread via respiratory secretions, like when kissing occurs, for example, fomites through shared towels and bedding. And then regardless of clade, the vaccines and the therapeutics are equally effective. So I just wanted to make the point that MPOX, regardless of clade, it's spread the same way. Uh, the vaccines and therapeutics, the approach would be the same as well. Now, as, as you may know, clade 1 MPXV is, has been endemic in several countries in Africa for decades. So this is not a new thing. Clade 1 has been around for decades, and it's endemic in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which I'll refer to as DRC, the Central African Republic, Republic, uh, Republic of Congo, Cameroon, and Gabon. So uh, it's, it's endemic in all of these countries because it is a zoonotic infection, and the animal reservoir is believed to reside in certain parts of these countries. So you, you're probably wondering then what's going on with the current outbreak that's going on there if it's endemic. So since 2023 in the DRC, there have been cases that have been uh, recognized that are much more widespread across the, the country. So they've been identified in provinces that were previously without cases, and the number of suspect cases is much higher than, than has been reported in previous outbreaks in DRC. There's at least two concurrent outbreaks occurring. So there's clade 1A, that's a subclade that is more in the western part of the country in, in Ecuador province, which is which you can see here in the dark red color. The mortality rate has historically for 1A been reported as ranging between 1.4 and 11%, so quite a large range, partially because uh, endemic cases occurred in very rural areas where there wasn't healthcare access. But there is an NIH trial, the Ticoviramat trial, that um, um, that is 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 being analyzed right now, and that study actually indicates that routine support routine supportive care uh, may have led to a mortality rate that was much lower than than previously hypothesized. Certainly not the eleven percent, but much closer to about one point seven percent. So that is that that is indicative to us that perhaps uh, routine supportive care alone might actually uh, result in less mortality than has been referenced about clade one in in the past. 
Now, clade 1B is, is the subclade that's occurring more on the eastern part of the country, particularly Sud Kivu, which you can see in this orangish, co orangish color on the, on the right side of the screen. That's, this actually seems to cause less severe disease than clade 1A. The clinical presentations seem to actually be somewhat milder um, and, and more on par with what we all have experienced uh, with the global clade 2 outbreak. The mortality rate for clade 1B is less than 1% consistently in DRC, and there have been no deaths in countries outside of DRC. Um, so clade 1A, it's only been detected in endemic countries. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the Central African Republic and Republic of Congo are two endemic countries. Clade 1B, however, has spread to some other countries outside of endemic countries. It's potentially associated with sustained spread in Uganda, Rwanda, and Burundi. Um, and it's associated with some one-off sort of cases, not sustained spread in Kenya, Thailand, and Sweden at this time. And there are some links at the bottom of the screen where you can find more information. I do want to say, though, that the outbreak in DRC, even though it is thousands of cases, there are something like over 99 million people who reside in DRC. So the actual number of people who are impacted is much lower than those numbers might suggest. And similarly, the number of cases that are occurring in these countries where 1B has spread is actually, uh, the, the country that's impacted the most has less than 0.002% of their population impacted. So I, I just wanna put that into some context and this is a common question that we've gotten. So how is it spreading in DRC and in other countries? So in DRC, it's a zoonotic infection. It's spread from animals to people, and that's occurring in some provinces, particularly impacting children. And then human to human spread can occur in households, particularly because households can be crowded and there's opportunities for prolonged and direct contact, particularly while giving care to, to children, for example. Sexual contact has in some cases also been associated similar to what we've uh, observed for clade 2B. And those cases are reported in men who have sex with men, but also in, in women. So it's no, it's not necessarily limited to, um, to one group of people. We're finding that sex in gener general, regardless of gender or sexual identity is involved. And there are exposures that are known to be occurring um, uh, associated with uh, sex with sex workers. There is confirmed sexual transmission in South Kivu with a high proportion of cases in adults, and men and women are both equally impacted there. Now, to countries outside of DRC, it's, uh, like I said, impacting a smaller proportion of people, but it's primarily via sex, particularly sex with sex workers, while visiting the countries with sustained transmission. And there is some limited secondary spread, but it's typically via household contact with the children impacted, and it's been very... Uh, it's been, um, you know, certainly there's like been no, no such spread in Sweden or Thailand, for example. Um, the potential impact to travelers from the United States, uh, few countries with sustained transmission, and there's few cases in most of those countries. So we believe that the risk to most travelers to those countries is low. What we're currently recommending for travelers is that they avoid close contact with people who are sick with signs and symptoms of MPOX, including those with skin or genital lesions. So that's not a new recommendation. It's still the same even during the, the ongoing CLAI-2 outbreak in the U.S., and to avoid contact with contaminated materials used by people who have MPOX. So that's clothing, bedding, toothbrushes, all of those things uh, because of saliva, for example, or fomites can be infectious. Now, we also want people to be aware that MPOX in, adult, in adults is spread predominantly via sexual contact. And there is a link here to a WHO situation report that, um, that states that. And there might be additional guidance coming from CDC um, uh, about this, just because we know we're, we're, there's a lot of concern, a lot of questions coming from travelers. And so there might be some more formal guidance coming from CDC. Uh, but these are our main points. Now, um, I'm not a modeler, but I can say that uh, we do have modelers at CDC who are looking at data and they've deduced that the uh, risk is low to the general US population. And even in their extreme scenario where they're, they're, the household secondary attack rate could be 30%, so that's double the previously considered worst case scenario, that most simulated outbreaks in the US would be small. 66% uh, had less than or equal to five cases and 73% had less than or equal to 10 cases. 
Most simulated outbreaks had minimal spread between households, 72% affected less than or equal to three households. So modeling suggests that even with extremely high secondary attack risk, household transmission, including cases in children, would most likely involve 10 or fewer MPXV clade one cases with minimal spread between households. And just as a, as a caveat, you all know that there's you know, modeling um, data in general when it comes to um, complicated situations abroad, countries that, that involve uh, conflict regions, countries as large as the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, data is imperfect, but based on the information that we have so far, um, including via some of our colleagues who are in these countries who are trying to collect data, this is our, um, this is what we we are recommending, and this is what we are concluding at this time. If there's more data that becomes available, that could change, of course. But this is what we this is what we feel at this time. So, if there happened, if there were to be a case in the United States, similar to what has happened in other countries like Thailand and Sweden, where someone travels and they they come to the United States. Our recommendations are very similar to what they are for clade two. So isolation of the possible clade one patients, including uh, if, if you have suspicion because of where they might have traveled to or certain behaviors, then clade specific testing is occurring in the United States. We're, we're actively doing clade specific testing for specimens, including ones that are tested by commercial laboratories and have not detected clade one. But you can expedite that testing if you have particular suspicion. And so contacting your health department is really important if you do suspect clade one. But as far as management goes, the active monitoring of all high and some intermediate risk exposures is, is the same as what's previously been recommended and is on our website. A close collaboration with clinicians, state and local health departments, and CDC is important. And then infection control is the same. Um, the the waste is is category B, um, um, unless you're dealing with cultures, which which most people are not. And evidence indicates that the existing vaccines and diagnostics used during the 2022 outbreak would be effective against clade one MPXV. This is a DNA virus. It's not mutating overnight. It's not the same as the SARS-CoV-2 virus where um, things could change and the vaccines and diagnostics would not be uh, uh, effective. And also just want to point out that Ticovirmat would still be the first uh, line, as, Dr. as Admiral Levine mentioned, um, even though there's been some preliminary data released from the NIH about their POM007 study, which has suggested that perhaps supportive care is very important, but um, maybe Ticovirmat is less effective. This is because that data is not yet final. Um, it was a study performed outside of the United States. It involved clade one. We do want to see what uh, what we learned from the clade two um, work that's being done by NIH's STOMP trial, and that is uh, that is underway. So, in summary. Although there's been spread of clade 1B cases outside of DRC, these appear to be limited at this, at this time. Mortality has been low. Cases appear to predominantly be associated with sex in countries with sustained transmission, particularly with sex workers. The risk in the U.S., including to children, is expected to be low for a lot of different reasons, but we are actively monitoring this situation. Um, and we'll revise estimates if for some reason that changes. And the risk to travelers at this time primarily seems to be associated with sex, sexual behaviors while traveling. And we want people to be aware of that. And also um, uh, we will come out with some um, more information since this is a common question that's coming up. Um, and with that, I'm happy to turn it over to the moderator or take any questions. Great. Thanks, Captain Rao. So, uh, like I said, we have time for some Q&A, so please drop any questions you may have into the Q&A box. Um, we've already gotten a few so far. Um, one that Dr. Wyna from FDA answered, but I wouldn't mind him sharing a little bit more uh, for those folks on the phone who can't see the question. And the question relates to adolescents getting genios for pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, because we know that genios is approved for those over 18. Uh, sure, I can uh, jump on that. So the, the question was when you say adolescents can get genios for pre-exposure prophylaxis, does that include high-risk adolescents younger than 18? I thought only FDA approved for post-exposure prophylaxis younger than 18. And I, I just want to point out that 
Uh, Junios was uh, actually authorized under an emergency use authorization in August of uh, 22. And that still remains in effect. I believe we're, we're, uh, we don't anticipate any changes to that in, in the near future. Um, quite a few children have gotten the vaccine already. Um, uh, it, for example, I note there that uh, today children as young as four months old have actually received the, the vaccine without any severe reactions or adverse effects that have been noted. Um, and uh, from, for example, from zero to four years of age, uh, 385 children have been confirmed to get at least one dose and 70 of them have gotten uh, at least two doses and um, all the way up to um, over almost 800 getting a dose from the age group of uh, 12 to 17. The authorization, uh, the emergency use authorization states that it's for the active immunization by subcutaneous injection for prevention of MPOX disease in individuals less than 18 years of age determined to be at high risk. It doesn't specifically uh, say pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis. So I just wanted to be clear about that. Yeah, if I could add just that, um... Uh, yeah, so I I, um, I led the ACIP work group in those discussions about this issue. So we are waiting to receive the final data from NIH's study involving 12 to 17 year olds, which will um, possibly be completed at the end of next month. And um, we are hoping to reconvene the ACIP work group to discuss that data and um, and to perhaps discuss it more with the ACIP during the February ACIP meeting. That This is a vaccine that was only licensed for, um, for adults because it was intended for occupational risk. And, and that's, you know, that was preceding this entire global outbreak. It was intended for occupational risk. All of the studies, all the data was in 18 and over. And so now this NIH study is there. It will help us understand. But regardless of that, um, as Dr. Orr, um, as Dr. Wyna has has pointed out there isn't uh, there hasn't been any safety concerns with uh, the younger children who have received it as post exposure prophylaxis, and since 2022 CDC has recommended it for adolescents who might have the same sexual risk factors for which the adults um, are recommended to be vaccinated as part of the uh, ongoing global outbreak of clade two B. So we do recommend adolescents get the vaccine um, if they do have those risk factors, and then others if they have concerning post-exposure, um, concerning exposures that would necessitate post-exposure. That information, like there's a risk stratification tool on our website. If, if there are any questions at all about that, we are happy to answer those at CDC or help the clinician make a decision about whether post-exposure prophylaxis makes sense for a particular child. And for those younger than six months of age, we actually recommend um, uh, VIGIV, vaccinia immune globulin intravenous, instead of the vaccine, just because we don't have um, enough data. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Wyna and Captain Rao. So, Captain Rao, I know you did touch on the NIH study of Ticoviramat in DRC, but if you could just elaborate a little bit more about uh, CDC's conclusions that they've drawn from that and where things stand. Um, so the NIH study, the, the analysis is no progress. And I think you're refer, are you referring to the Ticoviramat study involving uh, the POMP007 study in DRC clade one. And so um, they, they came out with a press release that um, said that perhaps supportive care made a very big difference and that the mortality rate had decreased, but that Ticoviramat may not have shown um, effectiveness in the, those who were given Ticoviramat versus not, that there wasn't effectiveness demonstrated. They are still continuing to do analyses and do a lot of um, you know, number crunching and, and sort through that data even more. Uh, so, so we on our end, we're aware that those are those findings, but until that data is final and also until the, the, um, the POM double, the, sorry, the, um, STOMP trial, which is also an NIH-sponsored trial, but is happening here in the United States. Until that data becomes final, it's hard for us to make a different recommendation at this time. We really need the trial data and for it to be final before we change our approach. 
But I will say that we at CDC have also have uh, IND data. So the data that was that that was returned to us after people received the Ticovirumab product under the investigational new drug protocol, we did analyze that. We did try to uh, make sense of it and to inform our policy about Ticovirumab access until the trials could be the trial data was available, and. Um, what we found was that people were, were are recovering typically, unless they're severely immunocompromised, were recovering within the time period that's expected um, to naturally recover from um, Mpox. And so it wasn't clear to us because we, we couldn't tease the data out further to understand how quickly they might have improved. And the SOMP trial is going to hopefully help us understand that. But it seems like um, um, our approach... Uh, our approach made sense to actually narrow it to those who we think are having the most severe outcomes or might be at risk for the most severe outcomes, and then for all other patients to access ticovirumab via the STOMP trial. And that is why our EAIND criteria was modified in early June. It was informed by our EAIND data. And, um, um, and so that continues to be a sound approach given what we know about the, uh, the DRC study. Great, thank you so much. Another question for you is around wastewater surveillance and the sensitivity and effectiveness at detecting MPOX in the U.S. I think I'll turn that over to one of my CDC colleagues. So, Joanna, is is that something that you could answer? Sure. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Joanna Prasher, also from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, um, where I'm currently serving as the lead for the domestic um, Readiness Task Force uh, in CDC's response for MPOX. Uh, right now, we have over 200 sites nationwide that are testing for MPOX uh, in wastewater using tests that can detect both clade one and clade two. So clade one would be detected, um, we believe, through these systems. Uh, we are monitoring that very closely. And as we continue to do throughout the clade two outbreak, um, if we see signals in wastewater, um, you know, which could either, again, be either clade one or clade two, we're contacting the public health departments in those jurisdictions directly to make sure that um, they're aware of this, of the uh, issues, if they haven't already alerted us, that you can tie it to clinical cases, et cetera. It's really a signal for us to do further public health investigations. But yes, wastewater can detect clade one here in the U.S. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, another question for CDC is related to condom usage and how effective it is in preventing MPOX? I don't think we on this call have that expertise, unfortunately, or we're, we're not with the Division of STD Prevention, so we'll have to uh, turn that to them and get back to you. Thanks so much, Captain Rao. Another question that we received is on the evidence that current diagnostics will detect clade one and that MVA-BN provides protection. Yeah, so those, I'm going to ask Satish Paniampali, uh, who is one of the team leads in, C at C in CDC's laboratory to answer this. Um, yeah, we, we do have, we, we do feel fairly confident about that. So I'm going to turn it over to Satish to answer that. So there are two questions, right? One is the detection of clade one using diagnostic tests. Is that the first question? Yeah, it's whether the diagnostic test would be the same for clade one and clade two, and also the vaccine. Uh, and and why is that? Why is the why do we not think that the virus, the two viruses, the two sub the the two clades would impact either one of those? Yeah. So the NV will say uh, that Joanna uh, mentioned that should detect both clades. So th th uh, the detection should not be a problem. And the second one about the effectiveness of Genius vaccine, um, when the Genius was approved, the FDA approval uh, required like animal studies that in that animal studies, non-human primate studies, the challenge was through the clade one and it was equally effective. So that, and also the difference between um, clade one and clade two is not mainly on the proteins that could impact the infection process. So, uh, you know, genius should be effective based on those studies. Yeah, and I guess I'll just add, Satish, correct me if I'm wrong, that these these viruses are so very large, even though there are some yeah. slight differences between them, where the actual, how the diagnosis is made, how the lab test actually makes the diagnosis is not impacted by those changes. And similarly, the vaccine, um, not yes. impacted, correct? I'm saying this in like non, non-science lingo, I think, because yeah. I'm, I'm not yeah. as smart, but thank you. Yeah, so this is a whole virus vaccine, so it expresses all the proteins. So even if there are some minor changes, it should not impact. Yes, that's correct. 
Great, thank you so much. Uh, some other questions we've gotten specific to Genios uh, for you, Dr. Wyna. Uh, does the EUA only cover doses that are distributed from the strategic national stockpile? Uh, yes, I actually uh, jumped in on that, and uh, but uh, there there was a question about that. The the EUA does not uh, specify uh, the source of the vaccine for the authorization, uh, and there should be no difference in uh, in uh, the the vaccines because the vaccine that's actually distributed is pretty much the same thing that's in the national stockpile, um, although. Uh, some of the vaccines in the national stockpile uh, are getting close to uh, expiration and are currently being tested for uh, expansion of that uh, expiration date. Great. Thank you. And there is another question that you answered in the Q&A box, which I appreciate. But for our folks on the phone, uh, there was a question about vaccine recommendations to countries affected by MPOX. Right. Recently, in just the last few days, the, the WHO actually pre-qualified the Junios vaccine uh, uh, under the same type of conditions that we have here in the United States, in which for uh, 18 and older, and then also um, if the benefit outweigh the risk uh, to consider it in those under the age of 18. Uh, they're actually currently also um, Evaluating uh, the LC16 vaccine uh, from that was uh, approved by the PMDA uh, in Japan, and um, for those that may have missed it last month, uh, the uh, US FDA uh, approved ACAM2000 uh, from Emergent Bio uh, Solutions for uh, the uh, indication for MPOX as well as for smallpox so that uh, that that's available as well and also under evaluation by the WHO for pre-qualification. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Wyna. Uh, a question I think for perhaps you, perhaps uh, our colleagues at CDC is related to recommendations on boosters. Uh, I know this is a question that we get a lot uh, across HHS and what the recommendations are for boosters against MPOX. I can start and then maybe Dr. Wina could actually add. So um, yeah, we get this question quite a lot as well. And I can understand the confusion. We do have occupational recommendations that, uh, that say that a booster dose for people who are working with more virulent orthopox viruses, and we did end up lumping monkeypox virus in with variola virus when we made this when we made those recommendations. And we called the less virulent viruses, vaccinia virus and cowpox virus and, and those orthopox viruses. But those preceded this global MPOX outbreak. Um, the, the ACIP recommendations, I think, were published around the same time that this outbreak was first detected in May of 2022. But the actual deliberations, the ACIP vote, all of that stuff had been going on for about two years before that actually was published. And I'll just explain that the reason that um, laboratorians have different recommendations from the public is that laboratorians are exposed to over, uh, Satish, what is it, over a thousand times more, potentially up to a, a thousand times more monkeypox virus virus than, than what is um, what people are exposed to during sex. And we know that just based on the amount of the, the type of research virus that many laboratorians are exposed to and from our testing of laboratory specimens. And so for this reason, even though they're wearing PPE, they're at risk for accidental needle sticks. They're uh, at risk for unusual exposures, aerosolized exposures, all kinds of unusual things can happen because of the, the, the potent virus that they're working with. And so for that reason, we like to keep their, um, their protection or their antibody, their circulating antibody levels much higher than we would for other people. It's not unusual for, for laboratorians, for people at occupational risk to have different vaccine recommendations from ACIP than the public. I, I also lead the, the rabies ACIP work, and I can say that we similarly have a different recommendation for vaccines, for titer checks, for all of that, for, for laboratorians, and it's for, the, it's for the same reason. Now, that aside, the um, um, we, we know that there's been a lot of questions and concerns about um, 
about whether and about whether protection is waning and um and that's somewhat based it sounds like on on lab research that has showed antibody levels to decrease within six months after the initial primary series is administered and we at cdc have also seen that in our data but the real real world data that we have access to doesn't seem to show that that's the case and satish also has done some studies that indicates that perhaps it's more than um, antibody levels, it's uh, cell-mediated immunity, innate immunity, other, uh, other aspects that might play a role in um, providing protection uh, against MPOX, and I'll let him speak to that because that's not my area of expertise. But, but long story short, we're not sure the clinical significance of those of that antibody titers waning. We have this real-world data, it's not perfect data, it's based on surveillance, it's, we only know what, we, what is reported to us, but that, that was published in an MMWR that was published in May of this year. Sarah Guagliardo was the first author on that if people wanted to look into that. But we found that the number of breakthrough infections or infections after two doses of the vaccine series was actually a pretty small proportion of national cases. And I know that occasionally there are clusters here and there in some jurisdictions. For example, in Chicago last year in May, there was a cluster of, of uh, cases that occurred among people who are fully vaccinated. We did investigate that, um, that cluster. And it was a very thorough investigation. And what we ended up concluding is that perhaps there was just increased opportunities for, um, for that to occur, whether it's via, I mean, not in that particular jurisdiction, but in other jurisdictions, whether there's sex parties or something else, increased opportunities, increased sexual partners. Um, the, those could have contributed to seeing that. We haven't seen that um, in Chicago again, even though there was all that concern at that time. And so I um, I, I think that, um, that our surveillance data, even though it's not perfect, and is suggesting that there's that there's not waning protection is still accurate. But but in addition to that, just today in um, Emerging Infectious Diseases, the journal EID, there is a publication from the United Kingdom, from the UK's um, Health Security Agency, so their equivalent of CDC, but for the UK. And that is also finding that their VE among patients were vaccinated in 2022 and followed in 2023, and they have a very high vaccine coverage there, was um, was 80% or so. And my understanding is that they too are not recommending a booster dose, and they actually might be comfortable with recommending, you know, something more, something even um I, I remember, they, they, they're, they're not recommending booster dose. They're completely aligned with us. We have unpublished data from a study that, that we lead in the Democratic Republic of Congo that Satish could speak to more if there's more questions, but that also um, seems to suggest that at least five years, there seems to be an anamnestic response uh, to uh, exposures when they occur. Uh, but there's more that needs to be done to analyze that data a bit more, and we are evaluating a seven-year time point as well. But all of this together is to say that we 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 just are not seeing a signal to suggest that there needs to be a booster dose right now. And so we are not recommending booster doses except for those people at occupational risk. And by that, we're referring to those specific laboratorians, um, um, research laboratorians who handle MPXV uh, or um, laboratorians who diagnose MPOX and are therefore also uh, working with the, the virus. We don't recommend it routinely for healthcare personnel. I know that's been an area of confusion. We recommend it for healthcare personnel who are traveling abroad to get the primary series. If they're like, for example, working with MSF, working with another humanitarian aid group to, uh, to provide care to MPOX patients. But in the presence of PPE in the United States, we have not really seen many cases among healthcare personnel. And so if PPE is used reliably, if it is accessible in the United States, it, it, it really doesn't need to be um, administered. And so Similarly, a booster dose does not need it is not recommended to be given to such a person. So, Satish, I don't know if you want to add, or or um, Dr. Wina, I, I I don't know if you wanted to add anything additional as well. You covered pretty much everything, uh, Agam, and uh, presence of antibody is just the one measure, and then we also know that even uh, if small pop proportion of the people who don't have circulating antibodies, when an exposure occurs, the immunological memory is very robust and they quickly generate the antibodies. And I, if I can, I'd just like to add one additional thing, and that is, uh, I know most of you know this, but uh, quite often it's not the obvious that we miss, it's the ridiculously obvious. And that is, is that um, this vaccine is, is not a vaccine that causes sterile immunity. This is something that is probably more appropriate uh, to uh, 
uh, label as um, disease modifying, we don't have really good data to support the fact that it absolutely positively stops all uh, presence of the, of the virus uh, in, in the body. Uh, and the breakthrough, the vast majority of the breakthrough infections that have happened have been relatively mild cases. So um, remember that um, just because you have an antibody level doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have uh, sterile immunity and getting boosters isn't necessarily going to increase that uh, vaccine efficacy across the board. Great, thanks all. So another question that we've got is related to what available data there is related to spread or potential spread of MPOX in facilities such as schools and daycares or pediatric clinics. Is that question for in the US or internationally? I guess I don't know how to answer that. Um, Joanna, do you have anything to say to that? I don't, I mean, in the US, I don't think we are expecting that to occur regardless of Clade, but um, I don't know if that's been part of the modeling. So I'm going to defer to Joanna. Yeah, so I can definitely say, and we do have this information on the CDC website where, again, we've not had clade one here in the US. So we don't have any data about spread here in the US, but we wanted to model to see what we could expect. So um, we did ask our modelers, um, and we can provide the link to that as well, to look at non-sexual transmission, uh, which include household contacts and contacts between children in high contact um, situations such as daycares, et cetera. Um, and that based on everything we know about the virus and based on the epidemiology we're seeing coming out of the impacted countries globally, we do not anticipate um, very much spread at all. Very small um, amounts of spread would be linked to transmission in, in non-sexual networks um, here in the US. So that would include um, in those situations like daycares, et cetera. So we are um, obviously continuing to watch very closely the data coming out of DRC um, and the impacted countries. But even in those situations, we're not seeing spread in their schools and those types of environments as well. We're seeing, as Agam had mentioned, um, mainly through sexual networks or potentially in close um, uh, contact in household members, um, et cetera, but, um, but not in those types of situations, even globally. Thanks, Joanna. Another question that we've gotten is whether diagnostic tests are only available at public health labs or whether they are available at commercial labs. And I can start with that and maybe turn it over to Satish as well for more information. Um, so clade specific tests, so there's um, robust testing for MPOX, as I'm sure this group is aware, um, that was stood up in the midst of our ongoing clade 2 outbreak. But since we've had this heightened awareness around clade 1 and wanting to make sure we have readiness, we've actually uh, dramatically expanded the ability for diagnostic testing that would also pick up clade 1 and, in, and actually tell you which clade you have, whether it's clade 1 or clade 2. So those tests are now available here in the US. Um, and through a combination of public health laboratories, federal laboratories, and, and work being done at places like the CDC, and with commercial laboratories, we now have good visibility and um, are able to do clade-specific testing on approximately 90% of the MPOX um, samples that we have here in the U.S. Um, so we're, we're in, again, continuing to reach out to clinicians to encourage um, clade-specific testing in patients, especially with travel history, to impacted areas to increase that number. But we have pretty good coverage at this point. But Satish, anything you want to add? Yeah, you, I think you added everything. I just want to add there's also like sequence uh, capabilities in some uh, state labs and also we request uh, samples at, routinely at CDC to sequence and, and detect uh, what clade it is. Yeah. Great. So I think we have time for two more questions. The first is for Dr. Wynat about dosage for Genios and the difference is between those over and under 18? Um, sure, yeah, actually the, the dosage for those uh, 18 years and older for subcutaneous is 0.5 milliliters. Um, and uh, for those less than 18, it's also 0.5 milliliters. Uh, there may be, uh, you have to look closely at and read uh, closely uh, under the EUA because we've also authorized under the emergency use authorization 0.1 milliliters to be given intradermally uh, for uh, those 18 years and older. So the dosage is the same for, for both age groups. 
Thanks for that clarification, Dr. Wynath. And then the final question that we got was related to the diagnostic capacity in the DRC um, and why CDC feels fairly confident, uh, despite the resource limitations there, that uh, the assessment that there's not a huge amount of risk of transmission and severity of clade 1B, uh, and it's not different from clade 2B. And I can start and then would welcome um, either of my colleagues jumping in as well. Um, so uh, obviously there are resource limitations, uh, both in the, in the DRC as well as in neighboring countries. And I should say one of the things we're doing first is to try to is to try to alleviate that problem. So we've actually provided uh, testing and training uh, to both the DRC and surrounding nations uh, to help increase the diagnostic capacity and to get better um, epi data um, of what's going on in the in those um, countries globally. So we've been working very hard uh, with the ministries of health in those countries and with our international partners like WHO, et cetera, um, to try to increase the, the quality and the amount of information we're getting. Um, I will say that um, our, we always caveat, of course, with what we don't know. So the risk assessments uh, here to the United States are caveated um, with, you know, it's based on the information we have at the time, but it is based on both um, the epidemiological data that we're seeing coming globally, as well as our estimation of the uh, impact should it spread here to the U.S., meaning that here in the U.S. we do have access to vaccines, to therapeutics, uh, to uh, palliative care, um, to all the things that would help decrease morbidity and mortality from this disease, even should it come, and that includes for clade one. So it's both the risk of importation and the impact it would have if, if it were to arrive here that leads to our estimation of the risk at this time. But Satish, anything you wanted to add? Um, just to add, we, we are trying uh, to improve the testing capabilities. We work with other USGs and WHO to get the kits uh, in a decentralized way. There are like a lot more uh, labs that stood up to, for MPOX testing. So we, we should be expecting to get like more results and all with the AP data we could have. Um, uh, a greater uh, amount of data on how the cases are spreading and uh, the CFR and everything. Great, thank you so much. And with that, we're actually a few minutes past time. So you may have noticed today's briefing is being recorded. We plan to post this recording on HHS's YouTube channel and we'll send the link to all registrants as soon as it is live. Thank you so much to everyone who submitted questions and to all of you for joining us today. Thank you also to all of our speakers and subject matter experts who were on the line from OASH, CDC, and FDA. I hope everyone has a great day and a great weekend.